Today, our presenter will speak about how Moravian missions were impacted by the changes of the 1760s. Christina Patterson is a historian of religion and a biblical scholar. She holds a master's degree in theology from the University of Copenhagen and a PhD in cultural studies from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. She has published extensively in different fields, biblical studies, religious history, culture, sexuality, and gender. Dr. Patterson has just finished editing a volume on David Kranz's history of Moravian missions in Greenland, together with Felicity Jens. And she has another book coming out with Brill on Zinzendorf's choir sermons as a source for changes in social relations, the establishment of gender roles, and individualization in early modern Europe. She's a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Moravian History. She has spent considerable time doing research in the Unity Archives in Herrenhut and has great knowledge of 18th century Moravian history. One of the good things of Zoom is that we are able to connect to an international audience. Today, we have people joining us from different parts of the world, Austria, Canada, Hungary, Norway, United Kingdom, and the United States. We are glad you are here. Our speaker will be speaking to us from Edinburgh, Scotland. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to our speaker. Please join me in welcoming Christina Patterson. And uh, Thomas, also, uh, I want to thank you both for um, inviting me. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, and I'm very excited that it's possible precisely because of Zoom, as you said. Um, I also want to preface all of this by saying that it is Olaf Nippe, who I'm sure most of you know, uh, assistant archivist in Hamburg, who not only has argued the significance of this period and raised my interest, uh, but has also helped me understand with unfathomable patience, uh, the various layers, connections, and councils. Um, okay, so this is all part of a book I'm working on dealing with the Moravian missions in Greenland and Australia. Uh, within this analysis, the changes in economic practice are significant, and this is what I examine particularly in the Danish West Indies and Bethlehem, given the high economic productivity in both places. Not surprisingly, such high gain outposts become significant in the restructuring of the movement after Zizendorf's death. The structure of the presentation is as follows. Part one is an outline of the nature of three Moravian mission settlements. And I want to draw out some of the differences between them in that each of them faced distinct challenges and possibilities. Then I move on to part two, the longest part, which recounts some of the changes in Hanhut in the years after Sinsendorf's death. And finally, part three looks at some of the resulting changes um, in a wider uh, frame. So part one. In the past year, I have been working intensively with the so-called household issues of the Moravian missionaries in Greenland, the Danish West Indies, and in Bethlehem. I've been obsessing about the relation between money and mission, or as the Moravians put it, between outer and inner things. I want to begin with a rather stern letter from Friedrich Kammerhof, Bishop in Bethlehem, to Geobeba and Abraham Meining, the leaders of the mission in St. Thomas. And the letter is from 1747. Kammerhof admonished them for letting the outer control the inner, whereas it should be, and as he notes, is practiced in the general economy in Bethlehem, the other way around. The inner should be the primary concern and the outer merely in service thereof. The reason Kammerhof gives for um, his admonishment is that the brothers in St. Thomas have not followed the agreed plan, um, which was to send the requested brothers and sisters to Bethlehem. Apparently, the St. Thomas leadership felt they had use for these members in St. Thomas and did not want to part with them. This, says Kammerhof, is direct disobedience to the Lamb's wishes and an emphasis on the outer qualities, uh, the economic usefulness of the people in question. And so I have a slide. Um, 
just uh, pardon me, I should have done that before. Um, here we go. Yeah. And so um, Kammerhof uh, describes these two ways of thinking as uh, Zeugen und Jünger Sinn, and that's uh, witness and uh, disciple disposition over against a household and plantation disposition. Uh, the former as being practiced in Bethlehem and the latter in danger of taking over in St. Thomas. The makeup of Bethlehem and St. Thomas were of course very different. Um, Bethlehem, as I'm sure you all know, was structured according to the general economy and thus had a house community working to uh, materially support the missionary activities. It was thus a very ambitious project with a solid workforce. St. Thomas, on the other hand, was a comparatively meager affair. Here, a small handful of missionaries had to earn their own bread through applying their trades. And when this was not possible, they had to find alternative ways of making a living. For example, overseers of plantations. This, however, tended to interfere with their missionary purpose. For the first five years, uh, two to three missionaries switched between living on plantations and renting small rooms in town. Sustaining themselves proved to be very difficult for many different reasons. And in the end, the missionaries turned to plantation ownership and sugar production as a way out. This was also not received well in Bethlehem, a disagreement which erupted in 1747 and which is probably hinted at in Kamahu's terms of you know, plantation disposition. While Bethlehem was a settlement with many production opportunities, these opportunities were channeled towards a noble purpose, namely supporting the work of the missionaries among the Native American peoples. The other mission in St. Thomas is after the mid 1740s, a mission with many production opportunities straining against the confines of the noble purpose and determined they felt by Bethlehem and a completely different social and moral context. In contrast to these two missions, we find the mission to Greenland, which in a sense retained a pure purpose, if we can speak of it as such. And by this, I mean that there were very few means of making money in Greenland for the Moravians. Not only had the Danish colonial administration informally monopolized trade, uh, but the missionaries had enough to do with surviving in living conditions with which they were very unfamiliar. In Greenland then, the Moravians were not tempted or led astray by the ways of the world. Furthermore, money was not a central feature of Greenlandic society at this time. There might be money in the sense that some in the Danish settlement may have purses with coins, uh, but there was little to buy. Christian David, one of the first Moravian missionaries in Greenland, did carpentry work for the Danish settlers, and it's possible that he was paid in cash, but even if he were, it would be of little use to him there. There was no shop where he could buy supplies, in that whatever resources were available were intended to be used, not sold. Money could be used, I think, for two main things, uh, paying for someone's labor, uh, and, some, and paying for someone's fair home. But even then supplies for su sustenance on the, on the ship had to be uh, supplied by oneself. So in this sense, you can see money is useless. Um, payment was made, uh, generally made in other ways. For example, sewing carried, carried out by the sisters in, uh, in Neuhamhut or New Helmhut in, in Greenland was paid for in bread. Um, which they could then use for a love feast. Otherwise, you ate what you were sent from Europe or what you harvested. And here the Moravian missionaries completely entered into the subsistence economy in place in Greenland, uh, something that the Danish missionaries never ever did. Add to this the logistical challenges posed by these three situations. In Greenland, there was for the first 25 years, only one Moravian mission station. Once the first congregation had take, taken shape in the late 1730s, the mission followed the Greenlandic hunting year. From April to October, 
some of the missionaries traveled out with the converts and in the winter months they were all settled at Neuhandhut, situated a bit outside Gotthok, the Danish settlements and even the Danish settlements they were very few and you really can't speak of a colonial society at this stage. So the expenses and logistics were relatively minimal at this stage. In the Danish West Indies, the colonial society had been taking shape since 1671. And it was a booming plantation by the time the Moravians arrived. Everything was expensive and skilled labor was often carried out by enslaved Africans, leaving little room for the Moravians to make a living. Once the mission was established and running, there was also the matter of transportation between the three islands, St. Thomas, St. Croix, and St. John. And added to this were the many illnesses and deaths of missionaries, which also was connected with a range of expenses in medicine, bringing in uh, people who had to fill in for the deceased and so on. The missions in the Danish West Indies were thus at the other end of the scale of expense and logistics, very expensive and complicated in uh, many different ways. And it should be noted, money was also becoming a significant part of the economic system in the West Indies, something that was deliberately avoided within Bethlehem. Um, Bethlehem, as Kate Carte has shown us in her book, Religion and Profit, was rather a self-sufficient economic system in that most needs were covered internally by their own production to minimize expenses, while surplus was sold to the outside world for a profit. Internally, it was a cashless household and as far as possible, self-sufficient. And this changed obviously in the years after Zinzendorf's death. So I've tried to set up these three locations as different stages in economic development. And the reason for this is that these centuries are generally times of transition from older social structures uh, an economic organization to what will become a market economy. And this was also uh, an issue in Hanford in these years. And I'm really interested in how these interim situations can be understood as dim dimensions of overall developments. But now we turn to the second part of the talk um, and the changes in organization um, in Hanford. have a drink of water. On the 30th of May, excuse me, 1760, 20 leading men in the Moravian community met for the first time since Simsendorf's death three weeks earlier. Johannes von Badeville opened the conference and stated that the advisory council will resume business little by little as a tree trunk from which branches go out. For almost a year, this advisory council called the Ratskonferenz met every other day and discussed matters ranging from managing gossip in Hernhut to restructuring the general economy in Bethlehem, from the need for providing a baker in Neuwied to ensuring a shoemaker for St. Thomas and so on. And this incredible jumble of topics uh, indicates that while there were a couple of subordinated bodies, this council was the main body, as it were, and um, it understood itself as taking the place of Zinzendorf and I assume the whole executive household, the, the Jünger house, and it understood itself as a dispatch meeting, Johannes von Wadeville said, an expeditionskonferenz from where issues were to be dispatched. At this time, then we have a, a, this advisory council which will um, in a couple of years become what is called the Enge, uh, Enge Conference, the, what I translate as the closed conference, um, bodies which carry out the preparatory, preparatory work for the General Synod in 1764. Um, then there's a, the Directorial College, I'll also be talking about them in a little bit, is a management body subordinated to the advisory council and they're then given specific tasks and duties to carry out. For example, the assessment and dissection of Bethlehem's, Bethlehem's general economy, one task. And uh, another is the establishment of the missionary deputation. So 
at this time in 1760, there was no overall responsibility for the Moravian missions underway. The correspondent with the missionaries was and had been since the 1750s, Johannes van Wadeville, who had been in charge of the collection box for the missions. And during the advisory council meeting on 1st of December, 1760, Johannes reminded everyone of the establishment of a college to manage the missions and wanted it to commence already from the new year. This matter was taken up, as mentioned, in the di directorial college and would eventually result in the establishment of the Moravian deputation, sorry, the mission deputation in January 1762. So actually a year after um, Johannes wanted it done. And so why would it take a year and I've been, I've come to think, and this is only really something that has dawned on me um, in the last couple of days when, while I've been working with this presentation, is that it is in the work with breaking down the general economy of Bethlehem and putting it back together again, that the structures for the new organization of Moravian's mission emerged. And I'm going to leave that to a side for now, and I'm not going to demonstrated sort of step by step. Um, it's more sort of, this is the idea that's bubbling in the back of my mind as I'm talking about these things. Um, but let's see how we go. So continuing with the minutes of the advisory conference, they show a continued dealing with mission related questions and mention several times that this or that will be a matter for the future mission body. So you know, clarifying some things and explaining this will be taken up later once this particular body is in place. So we are still in the planning phase. One matter uh, discussed twice is the difference between the settlements, Kulunin, and the mission, the Haydn Mission. Um, and the conference minutes state that in the first case, everyone lives from his own basis or font. In the second case, everyone lives in one household, or commune, and even he who only works physically does so for the best of the mission and is thus to be considered an envoy to the heathen, a heathen border, because he does it for the heathen cause. This does sound like the organization of work and mission as it was in the general economy, except at this time in December 1760, the general economy was under scrutiny and assessment as to how it could be brought back on firm footing. And we all know how that went. Um, so again, leaving this to a side, we now turn to the minutes of the um, directorial college from 28th of January, 1762. So this is more than a year later um, when the mission deputation in charge of the mission diaconate is finally founded. In the lead up, the minutes note that there are many reasons for the necessity of such a body, not least that Johannes von Wadeville, who had managed it until now, wants to devote his time to his other duties. But the minutes continue, circumstances have also changed. For example, there is no longer the eagerness among the members to serve as missionaries. They have started asking questions about external matters instead of just being willing to head off and serve the savior in so-called heathen places. Thus, it will be necessary, said, state the minutes, to ask the savior to restore this older sense of brotherhood among our people. Thinking back to Kamahov's criticism of the St. Thomas missionaries decision to hang on to brothers for outer reasons, this seems to have become a prevalent attitude and one which was regarded as problematic. Of course, the reasons could be many, um, work, family, or merely hesitation in that one could not be entirely sure of the outcome. The many deaths in service, especially in the West Indies, could have made an impact, um, or the extreme poverty of the missionaries in Greenland in the first five years. You know, when in during meetings when these things were gemeintag, when uh, these um, accounts were read out and, and um, from the diaries and all of these uh, events must have had an enormous impact on the listeners. One example is from the memoir of a Danish brother, Jeppe Pointum, 
who had joined the Moravian Church in 1760 in Zeist. Brandon was a trained bookkeeper, and in 1763, he was called to Hamburg to work in the shop. Upon arrival, more or less, he was ordered by the Savior through the close conference to go to St. Thomas. It seemed he himself was not entirely in sync with this idea. Uh, the minutes from the closed conference note that his hesitation was due to the climate, but the minutes two days later note that he surrendered after a couple of intense cons days consultation, a couple of days intense consultation with the savior. He traveled via Copenhagen to St. Thomas where he arrived on the 5th of January, 1764. He died a year and a half later, 37 years old. The point of this is um, that it is not for members to decide or think of anything about their calling because that goes against the whole idea of calling. And this immediate obedience um, is one which needs to be restored. Another fascinating point in the minutes concerning the founding of the mission deputation is the mention of the separation of the diaconate and what is called the credit stuff, the credit wesen. The minutes note that this separation is the case in the settled communities, the Gemeinden, and in future, it would be good if this could also take place in the mission posts where there are so-called establishments, that is businesses. It continues, um, the diaconate only deals with the upkeep, upkeep of the missions, just as the other, that is um, the credit, uh, sorry, now I'm, um, the credit reason, yes. Um, deals with the increase in revenue of the establishment and establishments and plantations. In other words, the mission upkeep and business ventures should be kept separate, just as daily upkeep and businesses are separated in say Kleinbilke. After these discussions, it was decided to establish the deputation. Three brothers, Leonard Dober, Johannes Paul Weiss, and Paul Eugenius Leiritz, were appointed to oversee the finances of the sprawling and growing missions in the name of the unity, with Johannes Friedrich Lucius as bookkeeper and accountant. The mission deputation, Missions Deputation, had three corresponding agents in Zeist or Am and uh, Zeist Amsterdam, um, London, and Copenhagen capitals or major cities of the three colonial powers in whose territories the Moravians were operating. The following day, the document confirming the establishment of the deputation and its members were signed by the directorial college along with the instructions. The instructions are 11 pages long and so we won't have time to go through them, but I do want to draw out two points of interest, uh, which are of interest in relation to what I've just been talking about. The instructions begin with the purpose of the missions. I just copied it here. Um, the purpose of all missions so far, organized by the unity of the brethren, is to bring to the poor heathens the great message from their creator and redeemer on their salvation and preservation in the grace they have received. For this purpose, it is not only necessary that the messengers and witnesses of Jesus who have been decreed to do so are provided with the necessary equipment and sufficient travel money to see them to their destination, but also provide them with a place to stay and a roof for preaching the gospel, as well as providing for their necessary upkeep. I find this interesting because this is a concession to the issues raised earlier about the concerns regarding outer things uh, members had with going forth as missionaries. Here it is written, sealed and signed that the responsibility of this newly established body was to oversee the material needs of the worldwide missions and to manage and distribute funds, the transportation of missionaries to and from their posts equip them with the necessary goods to sustain them and their work. The specifics of this responsibility is presented in the first six pages. It then goes on to explain where the money for this comes. It mentions three sources. 
first from biannual collections among the members uh, the, of the worldwide unity on Epiphany and the Nativity of John the Baptist. So every half year. Second, from the establishments erected to house the missions. And the final source is from the Commercial College, which was an investment society established in 1758 and which lasted for about 10 years. So my interest is in the second one, um, the establishments. The instructions note that in order for these to be utilized in the best possible way, um, the missions diaconie or the mission diaconie will collect notes on what belongs to which mission, gather all necessary documentation, proof of purchase, etc. Based on this, the mission diacony will then assemble a complete inventory of all the houses that have been built, the chattels in stock, supplies, in short, a complete and clear understanding of the economic state of every mission. It will assess which lands and houses are usable, which are useless, what is necessary for more culture and utilization, what is counterproductive, and it'll offer advice and, uh, and deeds. It is, in other words, a full economic assessment of the individual missions, their assets, and their potential for growth. It is these profits which uh, are to be used to finance the missions generally, and that's important generally, and in future will figure on the mission deputations list of incomes from our establishments. So these lists of inventories and values were already put together before Zinzendorf died, namely in 1759. Thus, missionary Korn from St. Thomas sends in a list of assets and possessions and notes that the St. Thomas sugar production has managed to uphold the missions on um, St. Croix and St. John, and that these missions thus would not be a drain on the diacony. And so that's important that the diacony at this stage um, in 1759, when Quan is writing, um, is merely merely the, the biannual collections and annual returns from the commercial society. Um, so um, the list and account that trickled in after Sinsendorf's death proved, uh, provided the basis for the work of the missionary deputation. The importance of the mission deputation and its sources of income cannot be underestimated. What this indicates is the separation of the inner and the outer spheres. And I mean, as before, the outer economic sphere would be in service of the missions. But in the post Sinsendorf period, this outer sphere was given a life of its own because it had to contrib contribute to all missions the missions in general, and not just the one mission to which it was connected. Because the establishments uh, of the missions had to finance other missions, uh, the Danish West Indian establishments, namely the sugar plantations, had to be um, separated from the Danish West Indian missions and from this outside position contribute to the Danish West Indian mission and through its profits to other missions. The founding of the missionary deputation to oversee, excuse me, the economic activities and assets of the missions is also an indication of this separation. The externalized sphere is what we today would call economy, but such an abstract entity was not a clear cut thing at the time. Uh, Adam Smith hadn't even published uh, Wealth of Nations yet. That wouldn't be published until 1776. And um, so the idea of, of economy, classical economy, was simply not um, around. The development, um, this separation and the development is firmly connected to the change in what is also normally called authority type, from a charismatic individual authority vested in the person of Zinzendorf to a more institutional collective authority. And this collective authority meant the active influx of a broader influence of people with different economic ideas, such as those of Friedrich Köber and Friedrich von Marshall, for example, 
who were both very active in in the in the dissolution of uh, of the general economy of Bethlehem. The push for different economic thinking was already underway during Sinsendorf's lifetime, as we saw, for example, in the gathering of the documentation of mission assets, but could only really be unleashed after his death. Another change is the change in expectations to missionary work. The first many missionaries to the Danish West Indies and Greenland were largely Moravian artisans who were severely put to the test. Especially the Danish West Indies claimed many Moravian lives. And while earlier this was the correct disposition, it was no longer so. And the unquestioning uh, sub submission to the will of the lamb had shifted. There are thus a number of levels where changes have crept in. So from the top, a change in the executive body of the unity, and then going down the centralized financialization of the mission, and, and then down to the slightly less obedient missionary. And so Guangdong is hardly the only one, or, nor is he an example of all, but um, his disposition and reaction to his calling is very different to say Tobias Leopold or Friedrich Martin. So, now I am moving on to part three. What do these changes mean? Some of the changes we already know about from the works of other scholars, um, such as the centralization of things in Hanhut, the elimination of the independence of the missions, and the increase of direct supervision and central control as far as possible given the distances involved more bureaucracy, not only in that the missionaries were accountable in two separate spheres, for example. Um, in Greenland in 1763, the missionaries received a number of letters from the mission deputation and another um, instruction on behalf of the closed conference. The mission deputation said that they needed to count their pennies and that um, the demands of the missionaries in Greenland could not go on as previous. They would have to retrench and reduce their expectations as to what could be sent. This was due to economic hardship in general, and also since the missionaries in Greenland were unable to contribute financially to the mission diakony. It is also um, mentioned in uh, one of the minutes from the advisory council that this is that the mission to Greenland is by far the most expensive mission because uh, the, the missionaries can't contribute financially. The letter from the closed conference included 55 points of, imp sorry, I'm either getting an echo or I can hear someone else in my headphones that I'm just a bit thrown. I'll just give me a second to <laughs> regroup. Um, so the, it's the most expensive mission. The letter from the closed conference that was sent to Greenland at the same time as the instruction from the mission, uh, mission deputation uh, included 55 points of improvement in terms of you know, outreach to non-converted Greenlanders, translation work which they could easily do in the winter time. I, I mean, not even thinking about that the winter time was when everyone was gathered at the mission and probably the most intense time. Um, more meetings, more supervision, etc. And all of this with less staff across two missions. I'm sure that people working at universities at the moment are nodding away at this. Um, but yes, so these are the two sort of tracks that the missionaries are then presented with. Um, if we turn to a Danish West Indian example, I'll again bring up Yebe Buenum, um, because apart from the fact that he was a reluctant missionary. The main reason for sending him to the Danish West Indies was that they needed a bookkeeper who also knew Danish and who could communicate with the authorities. And he was given two sets of instructions, one from the closed conference and one from the mission deputation. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to locate either or me commanding Olaf to locate them. Hasn't, uh, we haven't succeeded yet, but we're working on it. However, in Boindom's correspondence to the mission deputation, he writes that, um, you know, there's so many things he could sell in St. Thomas where they only to sell him, you know, shirts and rope and um, sewing needles and thread and goodness knows what. 
And so you get a sense that that the, one of the reasons he was sent there was also because he was sort of very entrepreneurial and could see, you know, immediately where money could be made and so on. While his memoir also mentions his missionary activities among the enslaved Africans, his communications only focus on bookkeeping, accounting, and money. And this is not only sort of a new feature, um, but also encouraged centrally because Bonham's appointment signifies the increased um, administrative emphasis on external affairs that had come to prevail in Hanhut, as I talked about in, the, in part two. Um, but what does this mean in relation to the congregants and what is the effect of the plantation disposition, disposition on the witness disposition? Um, in a report on the history of the mission to the Danish authorities from 1765, um, Bonham and two other missionaries, um, Mark and Kresma, mm -hmm. mentioned that the total number of converted slaves is 2,816 2, adults and 654 children. They state that in their teachings, they emphasize absolute obedience to the authorities and the and absolute obedience to the authorities and the owners, and that their church community sees fit to punish a slave who falls back into being unfaithful. They also note twice that the heads of slaves are not ordered so as to easily grasp things. I'm sorry, that's a quote. Um, either because the slaves are too wild, too dumb, or too old. This is also in the document. On the one hand, these statements may seem as expressions intending to demonstrate the well nigh miraculous nature of the hard work of the missionaries and to confirm their own allegiance to the authorities. Nevertheless, it is a change in tone because it demonstrates an approach governed by assessing the benefits and, and it presents the missionary efforts as weighed and valued the essence of it being we are putting in efforts and money in this difficult task to provide you with obedient slaves. So I'm just going to wrap up in a couple of sentences now. The forces that restrained the production potential of the Danish West Indies were unleashed after Sinsendorf's death, moving Danish church historian Harald Lavitz to note that Nothing can be said in defense of industry in the way it is driven in the Danish West Indies. It had, it had become like a certain tropical parasitical plant, which slowly but surely will strangle the tree it grows up against while it seemingly holds it up with its strong pillar-like supports." End quote. With the creation of centralized mission boards and financial bodies, the Moravians were increasingly drawn into the world at large and forced to think within its conditions. Massaging multiple missions into a large complementary hall, smoothing out wrinkles centrally, redistributing funds, in other words, orchestrating the economics, was most certainly a shift, and it might have been a necessary one away from the ad hoc structures of yore, but at what cost? Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for this lecture and this viewpoint that uh, I'm sure not many of us have heard before. Um, you compare the two new heron hoots, the one in Greenland and the one in St. Thomas and showed the role also that Bethlehem played in all of this um, and then connected it to a question that is really on the top of many of our minds, especially here in the United States in the Moravian church where uh, we have been talking about uh, slavery and the Moravian role in slavery uh, in the past. And uh, we are exploring that in a number of, of series that uh, some of us have uh, participated in. So all this comes very, very timely and um, I would like to open it up uh, for questions. Um, and if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I will then um, make sure that our speaker gets a chance to answer the question. Um, so, so 
while people are formulating their questions, I, I, I would like to ask you, um, so did I understand this correctly, that uh, the big change in uh, the organization of Moravian missions after 1760 was the introduction of the principle that all missions have to contribute financially to the other missions. And um, since some of these missions were financed by slavery, can we say that Moravian missions in the 18th century were financed by income from slavery? Uh, the short answer is yes, um, it, it, that is certainly the case. And I think that, um, um, so you said the big question was whether other missions should now be seen as contributing. I think um, I think I would at least um, add that one of the big changes is the establishment of a body that's meant to oversee this so that it's sort of an in, it's, it's institutionally sanctioned. I think that's quite Im important to what the point you're making as well. Um, that the institution provides a body that can oversee and distribute this um, this money um, that's coming in from from um, from the profitable missions and then redistribute it to the less profitable missions such as Greenland. Um, yes. Yeah. And of course. Uh, the Danish West Indies wasn't the only place where there was plantation slavery and there's also of course the British West Indies and then um, the whole um, mission in um, Dutch Suriname and how do you pronounce Ber Berbice or Ber how Barbies. do you pronounce Barbies. Yeah. 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 Um, and Moravians had slaves there as well. Yes. I, uh, the, um, so there was a big argument in 1747, which I alluded to between uh, Bethlehem and St. Thomas, where um, the uh, it's main the what I'm saying now here is written in Oldendorf's um, history of the of the Moravian missions in the West Indies, the big uh, four volume yellow thing. Um, he notes that the that the missionaries. Um, Oh no, sorry. It's from a, it's, a, it's from a di diary fragment in Hanhut. Sorry, it says that the 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 sugar works in the Danish West Indies should be destroyed, just like they were destroyed in Suriname. Um, and I asked um, I, I asked Jessica Kuntagen about this, but she wasn't sure what it referred to because it was nothing that she was familiar with from from her research. So I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it's certainly means that there was a, a sharp eye on, on uh, what was going on in other missions um, in terms of slavery and sugar production. Yes. Um, one question that came in from Scott Gordon here in Bethlehem, were the funds that came in from profitable missions always redirected to other missions or was it used for other church projects? Um, I, that's a very good question, and I'm, I, I don't know the answer um, to be sure. I think that one of the things was that these massive debt debt crises that the church found itself in was sort of spread out over various um, bodies, and so that the 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 paying back was taken from different pots, and so it could be that that some of the mission funds were redirected for other purposes. But it's not something that I that I really can um, answer precisely. Yeah. Um, you In your lecture, you mentioned something about a decrease in the willingness of individual Moravians to go out as missionaries um, around 1760. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Well, it's just that the minutes of the conference are very troubled um, by the fact that people are not uh, willing to just uh, obey a direct order, and but that they sort of are trying to um, to evade uh, what the leadership regards as the responsibility of the individual to immediately obey the will of the Lamb, but that members feel called upon to actually question such a thing. And 
I think it's it's um I would see this as as a well you know the whole term secularization is of course a bit um sort of weary but but it certainly does indicate um a sort of an encroaching of the world. I mean, that's that at on on the the mind of the Moravian unity in a way that is also evident in the money issues and and everything. So it's it's just generally the whole um, accommodation, I guess, to the practices of the world also means um, this not unquestioning and this. Does, means that there is a reluctance to unquestioning obedience and probably, oh, oh, um, 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 Scott's work on, on this, um, on the self and I mean the whole, the whole emergence of a, of a, of an independent self and the, the ability to actually question things, um, probably also is connected with this. Sorry, now all, of, uh, lots of things just happened all at once in my head, but. Yes, I think it's a very important question in terms of, of what kind of self was was underway in the period and and um, sort of an autonomous mind over against um, the submissive mind, which perhaps had been characteristic of the earlier period. Thank you. To, to return to the topic of slavery that we had earlier, um, uh, do you, did you find in the sources, and this is a, quest, a question of uh, Josef Kustelbauer, um, did you find in the sources a shift in discourse regarding slavery after 1760 among Moravians in Germany? Um, I think that it, it, Josef, you probably know much more about this than than I do, but at least in the um, in the lead up to the conference uh, or to the synod, I think it, is it maybe the the sixty nine synod where Altendorf um, Altendorf has to deliver a report on on slavery, um, and I think that that is one of the texts that that sort of makes an impact on. On the um, on the Moravian leadership, but it does definitely seem that there. Um, so Johannes von Badeville, for example, there's a letter from him in 1761, which is on the the Moravian um, the Moravian archives in Bethlehem's West Indies collection. It's uh, on the home page. So it's um, a letter from Johannes von Badeville to missionary Korn. Um, and uh, apparently the missionary has asked um, whether it's possible to, that they were thinking about buying another plantation fully equipped with slaves and so on to, um, to sort of increase production. And Johannes von Badeville said that he didn't think it was such a good idea, not that he minded personally, or that it, because he knew that, that slavery was regarded, that slave, he himself regarded slavery as, as innocent as um, agriculture and um, um, in Europe. And so that's at least Johannes von Badeville, who of course is a very prominent person in, in the unity who makes such a, a statement in 1761. And then um, the, the, the synods not opposing um, slavery in these profitable mission stations um, and Oldendorp's a report to the Synod, I would say all of these things together, yes, that there would have been a, um, an increase in this discourse. Mm -hmm. um, related to that, Sharon is asking, uh, did the Moravian authorities make a strategic decision to set up missions in the sugar slavery parts of the world because they could obtain profit from these missions? So did Moravians choose certain areas for missions because the plantations there seem yeah. to be more profitable than missions in other uh, parts of the world? That is a very, very intriguing question. And uh, I think that there are probably others in the audience with more expertise on this, on this than, than me, but I would think not. Um, I would think that because the reason that they went to these places is because there were slaves 
um, or enslaved peoples to whom they could um, serve as missionaries. And they probably had absolutely no idea what on earth a slave really was or what slavery entailed before they they took off. Uh, that seems at least to be the case in the in the Danish West Indies uh, mission, the first one to 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 enslave peoples um, with um, uh, Leonard Dover and David Nitschmann. Um, uh, this uh, I don't know whether it's an apocryphal myth or what it is, but you know the suggestion that they want to sell themselves as slaves to, and uh, and then place the Danish um, the Danish chief chamberlain said, well that's just not going to happen. You can forget all about that. And so this whole idea of what exactly is slavery, um, not and and then making money off it, didn't seem to be it didn't seem to be on anyone's mind. And that's the thing the 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 missions were never established with the intention of making money. That was something that sort of happened and were, they had to make ends meet for themselves. And the, the, the sort of building up of a, of a surplus and profit is something that only really developed along the way and, and was sort of seen as, hey, that's perhaps not a bad idea. Um, you know, we can just pull in a lot of money um, yes, so no would be the short answer. You mentioned the so-called Rats Conference, the interim administration of the church after 1760. Do you know how the, the members were chosen? Um, this is a question from uh, Peter Vogt in Herrnhut. Yeah, and um, I actually don't know how they were chosen, whether it was just... Um, whether it was, so uh, there were of course a number of um, bodies, uh, councils, bodies, whatever in place and that were under the direction of the Junge House. And that was, for example, the di directorial college and then the administrative college. And then there was a couple of other things that I can't quite remember, but these all had leading men in them. And so I was wondering whether the Ratskonferenz merely was just drawing together all of those that were already in leadership positions. And I mean, like I said, I think it was about 20, did I say 20 or 30? I can't remember. Um, and it was all men. And then the first meeting, they say that they want to, they deliberately um, only had men present because they wanted to avoid competition from the sisters, but that the sisters would be invited to the next conference, which the sisters then were. And then these were the um, sort of leading women and wives of, of many of the men that were present in the first round. But then the sisters aren't mentioned anymore any, uh, after as, present, as being present in any other conferences. What I'm interested in is also the movement from the Ratskonferenz, which is a rather large body, and then the narrowing in of that to the, the, the closed conference, because that's um, you know throwing off a number of, of members. And I would be really interested in trying to find out how that movement took place. But, but it, it is an important question because of the people who will make the decisions that are so important for the future of the unity. Right, right. There's a question uh, that's related to questions of gender by um, Anka Wilkening. Um, she asks, the immediate post-Zinzendorf era is also often referred to as a time of change in regard to gender and kinship in the Moravian church. Do you see any intersections between these developments and the transformations you are discovering in your work on economy and missions? Um, well, yes, I think, and that's then also just connects to what I was just saying with the Rats Conference and the presence of the sisters that then suddenly are, or they're invited in and then excluded again. And as um, Paul also has done uh, work on, on the sort of narrowing or curtailing the influence of, of the sisters. Um, one example, um, that I found quite interesting, and this was in relation to the to the work on David Kranz that I've done with um, Felicity, which Paul mentioned in the introduction. That um, um, Kranz wrote uh, the, the the mission to Gre the history uh, of Greenland. Of course, in these years, just or he was in Greenland in the now I can't remember precisely 62 or 63, and then gave a full report on things when he came home. 
And so his book is actually produced in these years of change. And um, one thing which I found quite interesting was his, his uh, narrative of, of Rosina Nietzschmann who came um, on visitation to Greenland in 1745 and had quite a significant role in establishing uh, some of the, the organizational practices of the Greenlandic mission and helping them, well, first of all, helping, uh, um, what's it called again? Um, Einrichten. I mean, so some of the, some of the, she brought along two sisters with her to marry with some of the brothers in Hamhood, and then she helped implement this new theology of marriage in the community. And she also helped them establish all kinds of meetings and conferences and ways of organization. And, um, and so this is obviously a very significant role and she was prepared for it before she left by Zinzendorf and there's documents about that in the Hamburg archives, but Kant narrows it down to just, you know, making her uh, be sort of an escort of these two girls to Greenland to drop them off, get married, and then she can go back home again. So there's absolutely no mention of her, of her um, role as eldress and sort of with these important duties. And so, yes, um, that's just one example of, of many of these things that that uh, that took place in the narrowing of women's roles. Yes, yes. Um, one more question, and then I will let you uh, go. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is a question that relates to Greenland, and in fact, it comes from Lab Labrador, from Tim Borlase. Um, um, he asks, my understanding is, is that Jen, Jens Haven came from Greenland to start the mission in Labrador in 1771, soon after schools began and written in Nuktitut to read scripture was begun. Was this normal practice for missions at that time and part of the new mission work? Mm -hmm. So the mission to Greenland um... Yes, yeah, so like I mentioned, the, the translation work that the, that the leadership in hand who thought that the missionaries could sit and fiddle with in the, e in the winter evenings, um, the Moravians, and there seems to be a competition as to who began this, but, but both the Danish missionaries in Greenland and the Moravians missionaries, Moravian missionaries in Greenland, both um, were very, very active in um, translation work and um, so the um, Hans Eil or Egedi, uh, his the, the Danish state missionary, his son Paul um, compiled a dictionary of um, of Greenlandic and um, and was also and helped the Moravians um, train in Greenland uh, train their language because they were completely hopeless when they first arrived. Um, and I think I was just looking at one of the other letters where. They were asking whether, I think it was Johann Beck, whether, because they needed someone in Greenland who could help with the language. And so they were wondering whether Johann Beck perhaps could help instruct people already in Germany in some basics of Greenlandic before coming to Greenland so that they had someone who actually um, could, could uh, communicate in the language. But yes, so language is incredibly important and they, they, they began early on in writing in Greenlandic, translating songs in the, um, in hymns um, with the, the um, inauguration of the fabulous missionary building in 1747 in October in, um, in Neuhamhut in Greenland. Um, they had translated heaps of, of hymns and songs that the Greenlandic people could sing for their um, at their love feast and the and the celebrations of the of the house. Uh, but my understanding is that Inuktitut has its own um, script, which Greenlandic Greenlandic is just a um, Latin script. Um, and so, but the, I think the languages are similar, except the script is different. But I um, could be wrong. Good. Thank you, Christina, for answering all these questions about so di many different uh, topics. Um, Carol Day comments, um, very troubling to realize how slavery became a factor in the fabric of the Moravian church. And um, I, I think that's one of the things that we take away from, from your presentation. Um, 
but many other things as well. And I would like to thank you for your presentation, especially today because it's your birthday and we wish you all a happy birthday. And um, I hope that the day in Scotland is not completely over, that you can still celebrate a little bit uh, together with Roland. Um, so a happy birthday to you and thank you for your presentation. Thank you all for watching and participating in the discussion. And um, uh, you, uh, we have other events uh, coming up. Uh, next month, uh, Thomas McCullough, Assistant Archivist, will speak about uh, how Moravians celebrated American holidays. And that will be on the day after President's Day.